My name is Mary Burley. I'm the chief educator here, and we are absolutely delighted to welcome you and also the celebrated artists and wonderful friends and supporters of the museum, David McCauley and Wendell Miner. These are extraordinary artists who, have authored, who author their own books. Both are known for intensive research and study, which they build on to create imaginary worlds. Um, David McCauley was the Norman Rockwell Museum's first artist laureate, and Wendell Miner is our current artist laureate, which, which is very special to us. Um, both ha have been instrumental members of our board of trustees, helping to shape innovation and our expanded mission as the seat of American illustration. So uh, it is really exciting to be here with David and Wendell. Um, David is an award-winning author and artist who helps us to understand the workings of every day, um, of everything from simple gadgets to monumental structures. And he employs pictures and words to reveal the secret lives of buildings, the wonders of the human body, and the common sense in the design of everyday things. A gifted visual storyteller, he inspires discovery by demystifying the complexities of our world while celebrating the places the imagination takes us when we least expect it. And I have really strong memories as a little girl of sitting in my mother's lap and, and her reading Pyramid and Cathedral, some of his early picture books, and saying, Mary, this is really important work. Look at the perspective, study the drawings. There's nothing else like it. And in the present, I never thought I would meet you, David. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so transcending the boundaries of time, culture, and geography, David McCauley's books reveal his lifelong love of history. He's a Caldecott medalist and recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Genius Fellowship. Um, he's perhaps known for his international bestseller, The Way Things Work, um, but many titles include The Way We Work, Getting to Know the Amazing Human Body, Cathedral, City, Castle, Pyramid, Mill, Underground, Unbuilding, Mosque, and Ship. David's elegant and whimsical picture books include Rome Antic Antics, Shortcut, and Black and White, the winner of the Caldecott Medal. Also a very big deal when that came out in all of our local libraries and um, wonderful memories of that. Um, his art was the subject of an enthusiastically received exhibition at the Norman Rockwell Museum titled Building Books, the Art of David Macaulay, and it traveled to 14 museums around the country. Um, David has recently completed a new edition of his classic book, The Way Things Work, and um, he, he's reinvented as the way things work now. In addition, he's in the midst of a new book that tells the story of his immigration from England on the USS United States, the focus of an upcoming exhibition, um, which will be here. So, David, welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Um, I'm going to talk about two books that are actually available. Uh, I was originally planning to talk about two books, neither of which um, was available. One because it's out of print and the other because it hasn't been released yet. Um, that didn't go down well with the manager of the bookstore. So I said, well, okay, let me rethink that. And um, so I'm talking about two books that are sort of connected to each other. Building Big is a book I have never talked about before. It, was, um, it came out in 2000. Um, in time to uh, you know, sort of accompany the show, the five videos that we made uh, between 98 and 2000 about skyscrapers, domes, tunnels, bridges, and dams taking us all over the world, filming, and so on and so forth. So um, I didn't really want to do the book because I thought, honestly, the films will do it. Why repeat what's in the films in book form? So, but, you know, the producer said, this is just too good an opportunity for you. You really should do this. And so I put it off and put it off. And eventually I had about eight months in which to do this book, um, make all the drawings and write the text and do the research. So it was a hellish process. Uh, and I, you know, I, but I survived it and the book came out. But that's why I don't talk about it. I'm still just getting over it. Uh, anyway, what I did the other day, this is really bizarre, I wanted to give you a little bit of that sort of sense of being on location uh, to break up the slides for the book. Uh, so th I literally ran the, the discs through the, an old laptop I have, and I used an old um, 
iPhone camera to shoot it. So these are taken off the screen. And this is Rome, where it, one of the first places we went, one of my favorite places in the world. The whole process for me began with sketching, a lot of sketching. Um, I should have probably been doing more actual research, but the sketching was much more fun. Um, the book has that feel of sketchbook to it. The, the, the drawings are kind of rough and, and so on. Um, not only because I wanted it to be sort of lively and engaging, but because I really didn't have time to do lavish and elaborate drawings. And it would have been... Um, probably inappropriate anyway. So a few of the, um, also you will see that in this, yeah, this is the Chinese edition. Um, you're probably thinking, why did he use the Chinese, Chinese edition? Not just to show off, but because it's a paperback book and it opened much more easily on the scanner without breaking the spine. And if I did break the spine, there are probably more. So um, this, is, this is Garabit. This is a bridge designed by Eiffel. That's me demonstrating the power of wind while giving, while giving the lines and, and trying to remember them and all that sort of stuff. It's a wonderful experience to go to these places and learn your lines and work with a crew because um, for, the, for most of my life I'm in solitary confinement in the studio, chained to the drawing board for two years, four years, five, six, depending on the book. Uh, so the opportunity to get out and work with a bunch of people on, on a limited time um, you know, basis is wonderful. Scotland and the Firth of Forth, uh, how to get this across in a book that was, as I say, sort of sketchily drawn, but mostly diagrammatic. It, it, it did what the film couldn't do. So I guess our hope in the end was they'd sort of go together and you'd have the book open and you'd also be watching the, the, the DVDs. Um, I prefer to watch the DVDs. Um, San Francisco, uh, up about 700 feet above the water. And you can see San Francisco on the right-hand side, just, just above the, the cable. That was an extraordinary experience. And in the sketch on the left-hand side, you can see that we, what you're looking down on past the cable is a, is a container ship or a cargo ship of some sort. And when I looked down, first I saw clouds. And then the clouds moved, and I saw the road with traffic. And then below the road, this huge container ship came by, and then, of course, the water. It was, it was fantastic. It was wonderful. And it had been an awful rainy, dreary day, and it was warm and sunny up there. You'll notice also in many of these sketches, you'll see this. That means that I'm thinking about the page of the book, but I have no idea what it's actually going to say. Uh, and that's okay because these are not meant to be f in, in any way finished drawings. Um, but it's, I'm always trying to think about the physical book as I'm making sketches. And, and then, uh, you know, to sort of tell the story of the construction of the bridge and how you need anchorages and how you actually string those wires, which is a fascinating process, but very logical, obviously, uh, until you've got a major cable hanging from both sides uh, over the towers, and then you can start hanging. We went and did a, 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 some filming for a tunnel, and um, this is the Hussack Tunnel, not that far from here, and um, this is how it was done. These drawings are um, fountain pen and marker felt marker. And tunnels also go under the English Channel now, at least three of them, and although they're all linked together. Um, and we did film part of it in the train. They decided this would be really terrific if I could be on the train and, you know, my dinner is delivered to me. The, the thing the director said was, um, okay, now remember, as soon as the train goes from light to dark, you start with your lines. Right. I'm sitting there and it's light, and then it's dark, and I'm thinking, that's fantastic. And I look up, and I see the blood has drained from her face, because there's no backing the train up in take two. I'm, so anyway, it worked out okay, but um, I, how quickly I forgot. Here's, the, here's the, the, uh, the tunnel that both of the train tunnels share. This is the escape tunnel, basically, which we did walk into um, quite a long way. Then to, then to Istanbul to look at domes and to Rome and so on and so forth. I tried to, you know, sort of take a dome apart here and give you some sense of the stresses and how you keep pushing up against the dome, gradually rising higher and higher so the thing doesn't just flatten, which, of course, is what domes really want to do. And then to this dome, this is um, on the infield of the Astrodome, um, with my pad. Now, this just, this is, this is, give you an idea of how much fun this is. Um, I'm drawing upside down while trying to remember my lines and face the camera. <laughs> so, so anyway, here it is. Uh, it, it's basically just a, 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 you know, a field of towers gradually rising toward the center of the space and then, you know, truss pizza-shaped 
things that are curved and they drop in. And what you end up with is a structure large enough to actually hold all the other domes in the section, whether it's uh, you know, St. Peter's or the Capitol or the Pantheon or Hagia Sophia or um, the French uh, Invalide. Egypt, next on the agenda. This was spread over about um, two years, this filming, um, which is why I didn't get any research done, basically. I was having too much fun. That sort of gap in the background, not the distant gap, but the, the, you, that's a dam on the right-hand side, the, that little bit that you can just see poking in that got blown out by a flood around 4,000 years ago. So I'm explaining that, and it's really hot. Um, here's a dam that has not blown out, but also a fantastic... Um, to talk about and to visit and all that sort of stuff. And then my job was to sort of bring that into sort of a simplified um, view so you got a sense of where the various uh, waterways were, um, the spillways as well as those into the power station and into the turbine room and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the construction of it. And, and here's the last dam we did, we went to Brazil where there are some enormous dams and this is one that's under construction. Um, standing at the bottom of it. It's about 40 stories high. It's about 400 feet. Um, and I have, I'm wearing the hat, just in case something falls off or rolls down the hill, as if it's going to really help. Um, uh, this is one of the, the double pages. Of, you know, I had this sketchbook that was actually a dummy for another book that we never did. Um, but here I'm, I'm standing, and it's starting to rain. But you can see the dam under construction on the left-hand side, and you can see a, um, a channel being cut through the hill so that water can be um, steered away from the dam site at a certain point so they can actually build it without having to stand in water. Um, so the gateways uh, and, and so on. And then the, the sequence, you've already got a sense of that. The largest dam we went to is uh, Itaipu, also in Brazil. It's a monster. And that little area in the center with the red line around it, if you blow it up, it looks like this. And that's a car. So you get you know, some idea of the scale of this thing and the lake you know, it's an ocean. It's not a lake behind it. But um, and to Istanbul um, next, uh, not for building big, but to do a book about the building of mosques. About um, and I decided a, about a week after September 11th in uh, 2001 that I wanted to do mosque. I'd done cathedral, um, and I thought it would be appropriate to reflect, um, you know an image of a culture that you know, is, is, is about to be assailed for the actions of a few people. Um, and I thought, this is an, these are amazing buildings. So why are they still standing after you know, 400 years in a, an area that's sort of known for its earthquake uh, tendencies? But they're standing because they were you know, brilliantly designed. And so I spent a, you know, a couple of weeks in Istanbul um, sketching. Details. You never know where these things are going to come in, in handy or whether they will or won't. But I was so afraid of making real boneheaded mistakes, which I thought, you know, um, that I, that's a risk I cannot take. Um, so I built, even built a couple of models, um, qu quick models, but nevertheless um, useful enough for me to get the perspective established and the proportions established and so on, that sort of thing. Um, the actual moss looked like this. And you can see that the color is fantastic. If you haven't seen them, make the trip. It's really well worth it. Um, cathedral, castle, city, pyramid, all black and white. There was no way this could be a black and white book, even though, having said that, cathedral, uh, I'm, you know, everybody sort of misinterprets it as just like the color of stone, but in fact it was very colorful. They were very colorful buildings when the statues were painted and so on and so forth, and of course the windows and the light through the windows. Um, but there was no getting around it, so uh, the book ended up being in color. And it, I did it the same way where I sort of explained from the beginning, what does the plan look like, um, what are the workers doing, um, how does this thing grow, where does it start, the domes, the small domes over the porch, um, called the latecomer's porch, pretty obvious why it's called that. Um, and then gradually, of course, the buildings rise and you create the support for the dome itself. These are, draw these are drawings with um, their pencil and sometimes ink, um, but using uh, Prismacolor, colored pencil, which I highlighted um, somewhat in the book or heightened for the book itself. Uh, so anyway, now you know how to build a dome. And then, of course, the ceremony at which the, the dome is the the building is dedicated, and the entire complex associated with you don't, you don't just build a mosque, you build the soup kitchen, and you build um, the school, 
we've heard bad things about the madrasas, and I think probably in some cases it's a little extreme. There's the tomb of the admiral, um, and then there are also in the upper left-hand corner two rental buildings. These guys thought ahead. You know, they would sort of, if you needed a place to sort of leave your camels for the night, for instance, you could rent a space in one of these two buildings, and that would be income that would keep this organization going um, into the future. Um, then I got this, and this is the other sort of thing that connects the book I didn't want to do with another book that I never thought I would ever do, which is to redo Cathedral and Castle. And um, having seen Mosque, the publishers decided that they really, we really should produce a color version of those two first books. So those of you who are like pen and ink, um, it's a whole different thing, obviously. Uh, their plan was to um, simply scan the drawings and have somebody come in and um, drop in color, you know, dis digitally. And I said to them, with uh, the most control I could muster, um, the reason for making all those little lines in those black and white drawings is that we don't have color. So you create the illusion of form, shade, and so on and so forth by cross-hatching. Now, if you're going to put a layer of color over the cross-hatching, it's going to look like mud. So, um, so I said, no, let's just forget about it. And I thought about it for a couple of weeks. And then I said, well, all right, you know what? Let's do it again. Let's just start from scratch. You cannot mess with the original. Let's just start from scratch. So I'd learned a lot about you know, the process, little things I didn't know when I did the book back in 1972, 73. And, um, so I had much more detail to play with because I'd worked with experts doing the film that we did about Cathedral. Um, who, they sort of went through Cathedral with like, their pencils ready to go. And um, we went through every page and they corrections here, correction there. Which this would be the other way. So I had all this information in my head. So um, I decided that maybe telling it again wasn't a bad idea. This is, to me, a preferable book about the building of a cathedral if you want to really learn about the building of a cathedral. It's much more accurate than the black and white original. It's just not powerful in the same way that pen and ink and the black and white images are. So that's the trade-off. I have no regrets about doing it now. I did at the time. But, um, you know, particularly with the windows and stuff, the kind of, um, you know, colors you can get with the glass, uh, and, and the light coming through the glass. The problem with this one is the, the uh, tracery, the stonework is not dark enough, but, you know, I missed that one. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it was sort of fun to revisit this and to really clarify the sequence and get all this stuff across. Um, the the, the um, flying buttresses in the rain, so you could see where the water goes across the buttress and out through the mouth of the gargoyles. Um, and then you, could, you get to do drawings like this, which are just kind of showy off. Uh, kind of things. Um, and then the, in the distance, as the town uh, goes about, it's, you know, the, the thing's been growing on the hill for 100 years, so people aren't paying attention to it anymore, but it's still, you know, their pride and joy. It's waiting for its faca west facade and, and so on. Anyway, um, and, and um, then I did, I, because, you know, we really wanted to include this, um, I, I went back to Castle. I didn't change a lot of Castle, but I did redraw everything again so that I could, um, you know, use color appropriately and not as a, like, makeup. Um, this is my favorite drawing from the new Castle, um, but it tells the same story. And uh, this, these two books, Castle and Cathedral in Color plus Mosque, became the second book that I'm talking about, which is um, built to last. And, um, and it ends with the, um, th the completion of the town, which is now uh, you know, sort of shared by both the English and the Welsh. So there's no longer a need for this incredible fortification up on the hill. It just becomes a quarry from which stone can be removed to you know, create some of the buildings in the town and so on. So those are the two books I wanted to talk about. I've done it. Now I'm, I'm, now I'm moving along, and I'm going to give the podium back to you so that you can introduce Wendell. All right. Wendell Miner, uh, and, and we'll, we'll take time after to ask all kinds of questions. Okay. Um, so Wendell Miner is an award-winning illustrator who drew his way through childhood um, in Aurora, Illinois. Uh, inspired by America's heartland and the richly illustrated magazines that were so much a part of his life at the time. From nature-themed favorites like Outdoor Life and Field and Stream to the vastly popular Saturday Evening Post. 
um, determined to forge a career as an artist. My understanding is you sold your Chevy, uh, your 1955 wonderful Chevy, to pursue studies at the Ringling School of Art and Design um, in Florida. He moved to New York in 1968 with little more than his portfolio in hand, and since then his striking visual narratives and elegant designs have appeared on nearly 2,000 book covers and more than 50 children's books. Um, nuanced reflections on who we are, where we've been, and what we aspire to become. Um, tonight, Wendell will share um, adventures and write and uh, adventures about writing the books Abraham Lincoln, Balls, Buzz Aldrin, Night Flight, and Edward Hopper, um, all of which are available um, at our store. So, um, welcome, Wendell, and thank you for being here. Subject tonight was was basically about uh, author illustrated. Now I've done probably eight author illustrated, but I do work with a number of uh, other authors where we co-collaborate, we conceive books together and collaborate all the way through the process, so I'll be showing you some of those. But one of the uh, most interesting projects early on, my editor at Scholastic said, if you could do anything you want to do, what would it be? And I thought, I want to go to the Grand Canyon and paint on the spot, keep a journal, and that becomes the book whatever happens. I've always been fascinated by Thomas Moran and uh, uh, Bodmer and uh, George Catlin as they're documenting the West. They went West before cameras were available and they brought back these wonderful images. It was a very humbling experience. I'd never been to the canyon and I thought, well, what can I come up with? But uh, these are uh, my original watercolors done on the spot, uh, keeping my journal and uh, that was one of the best studios I've ever had, I have to say. Just thrilling. Uh, it, was, it, it was, I did for two weeks from dawn to dusk, I just did, I did about uh, 35 watercolors and about 35 drawings during that period and selected from that. Um, this is from the title page. This is the book design itself. So I talked about shapes and lines, and I incorporated a, 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 a bit of history in the canyon. And those who were exploring the canyon in earlier times, like John Wesley Powell, there I am. In, uh, this is Powell Point, and I am creating the watercolor that you see at the bottom. So I really, I really felt the the closeness of nature and the immediacy of of creating these sketches, and they were all done within a matter of two or three hours apiece. Now, something for something entirely different is another book that I have authored called Yankee Doodle America, which has just been republished as Yankee Doodle Alphabet. I was very much fascinated by the Brainerd Collection and the Hartford Historical Society of the old early in tavern signs that are so much a part of New England history. And I thought, what if I created these in signs and created a person, a place, or an event in alphabetical order. So this is sort of a, a history book in, in visual form. I had uh, a carpenter friend of mine take two patterns and build these signs for me, and they are all hand-lettered, hand-antiqued, and I had a wonderful time doing them. Here is my studio with, uh, I think I had the 26th one on my, my board at that point, uh, but uh, this had proved to be a very successful book in the fifth grade um, school classes across the country because it's an introduction to the Revolutionary War. And uh, it was great fun to do that. How big did your pumpkin grow? Did you know that the world's record this year is 2,264 pound pumpkin? And I've always been fascinated by these crazy people who grow these giant pumpkins. And so I tried to imagine what it would be like if you had magic pumpkin seeds. How big could your pumpkins grow? As a matter of fact, uh, the winning pumpkin, usually the owner can sell off the seeds for 1500 to $2,000 a seed. So it's, it's like stud fees for a horse, you know? <laughs> so I, what I did was I created a, ge a geography lesson on different parts of the country where you could find bigger and bigger pumpkins. We wound up at the end, the last one is at the Grand Canyon. So at the end of the book, you have a whole glossary of, of places, 
uh, of where these pumpkins appear. So it's a little bit of a geography lesson for a young student. Right in the middle of Brooklyn Bridge. See, I do a little bit of architectural stuff too. <laughs> Here we are as pumpkins and pres uh, as president. And another uh, fascinating subject is we live in rural Connecticut and we've always been fascinated about the daylight and starlight creatures that we have recorded over the years, the diurnal and nocturnal animals. And so what this is, is uh, in your urban backyard, if you really are closely observant of nature, what will you be able to see in daytime and in, even, in twilight and evening time? So this was just a, uh, a couple of slides uh, showing the interior of the book. We had the Luna moth and the yellow tiger butterfly that you would find in the daytime. Luna moths are quite rare if you've ever seen one. It's quite a treat. And usually the only time you see them is at night. Again, there's just a split screen of daylight and starlight. Now, we get to one of my favorite projects of all time is working with Buzz Aldrin. Um, I wrote a letter to Buzz. I, I, I was a NASA artist. I covered the launch of Discovery after the Challenger disaster and got to know a number of people at NASA headquarters. And uh, it suddenly occurred to me that no NASA astronaut had ever written a book for children, a children's book. Now, I knew Neil Armstrong wouldn't do it because he's very quiet and very reclusive and, and uh, didn't want any part of the, the limelight, but Buzz, Buzz did. The, the, the thing about Buzz is they say he would go to the opening of an envelope and never miss it. <laughs> so, and it's true, he's quite a character. So when I, I, I sent him a couple of samples and a letter saying, I think it's time you tell your story. About a week later, I get on the caller ID, it says Buzz Aldrin. I said, holy cow, he really is taking this seriously. Uh, but it was his wife, Lois, who said, uh, I make all the appointments. Buzz will be in the city next week. Why don't we have a meeting? Well, Buzz had no idea of what, the, what a picture book was all about. And he said, look, I'm not a writer. I'm a talker. I said, we can work on that. And I said, I, if, you, if we can sit down and, and you can record your life story, I'll write it. And my editor and I will put it together. And that's what we did. Here we are at the National Book Festival uh, after our book came out. I think this was in 2005. If you notice, if you look carefully, he has a Buzz Lightyear tie on. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's got a wonderful sense of humor. He is truly a rocket scientist. Uh, he's got his uh, doctorate from MIT. As a matter of fact, not too many people know this, but the rendezvous techniques that we use through the... Uh, the process of getting to the moon, he developed all those mathematical formulas. Otherwise, we never would have gotten to the moon. So the Gemini program is, as a matter of fact, he, he saved, he was on the Gemini 12 mission, and he saved it because the computer had failed. He saved it with his slide rule. He could sit there with his slide rule and out, outsmart the onboard computer. It was amazing. So Buzz, Neil, and Mike were all 39 when they landed on the moon. This is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, July 20th this year. Buzz, uh, Buzz just turned 89 in January. Neil left us two years ago, and of course Mike Collins is also still with us. His first airplane ride was on a Lockheed Vega painted to look like an eagle, which I thought was rather fascinating since the lunar lander was called the eagle. His father worked for Standard Oil New Jersey, and their company plane was painted to look like this. Well, Buzz confessed that his first airplane ride he threw up. His father never let him forget it. <laughs> he grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, he said that he would always go out when the moon was full and always wondered what it would be like to walk on it. And this is when he was just a kid. He, he somehow was destined to do this. One of his uh, interesting adventures that he'd love to tell a story about is uh, they would summer at the lake, and he collected these rocks along the lake shore. And one day he decided to put them in this plastic uh, red bucket and take him down to show his friend Stevie his wonderful rocks. And Stevie loved the rocks. He, as a matter of fact, he wanted one, and Buzz says, no, they're mine. Well, Stevie got a little irritated and just pushed Buzz off the dock. Still holding that bucket of rocks, he sank to the bottom. Stevie's father saw what was going on, dove in, went down, and pulled Buzz up. 
he was still holding on to that bucket of rocks. He says, you know, if something's important to you, you have to hold on. And he also did something else that, you know, was quite remarkable. In 1940, he was 10 years old. He rode his bike all the way to the George Washington Bridge just for the thrill of seeing this superstructure. And if you look at the superstructure of the George Washington Bridge, it looks very similar to the superstructure that held up the Saturn V rocket. He did 66 combat missions in the Korean War. This was a, uh, an image I did where he had just had his first MiG kill and was quite celebrated about that. On his way to the moon, he talked about the fact that you could really rub out the Earth with your thumb. And uh, he, here he is looking from, from the lunar lander back. What's amazing about technology, we're talking about it, is that we landed on the moon with 78K of memory. The lunar lander and the command module each split that 78K in half. And when you think about what we could have, what we did, what we accomplished 50 years ago was so little, your iPhone could now launch every rocket ever launched by NASA, which is truly extraordinary. And of course, at the end of the book, he talks about what it was like being the second man on the moon. He said, uh, he says, I'll tell you a secret. I was the first astronaut to pee on the moon. <laughs> I said, okay, boss. Um, but everybody remembers what Neil said, you know, uh, uh, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Buzz said, magnificent, magnificent desolation. Nobody remembers that, but he talked about the brilliant white gray powder that was almost like powdered sugar when they stepped in it. As a matter of fact, they didn't know whether the lunar lander would sink or not, but there was only a, a, a very... Sh uh, shallow surface of this dust, and then it was hard surface. But um, and there has always been much said about the, uh, the 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 ruffling flag that was all wrinkled though in its compartment when they pulled it out. It almost looked like it was waving in the breeze, but it, obviously there is no atmosphere on the moon. Thus, all those conspiracy theories about never being on the moon. The second book he wanted to do was quite extraordinary. He says, "Let's do the whole history." of, of um, exploration, you know, uh, from the very beginning, and, and we'll do it in 40 pages. I said, oh, okay. Um, so we spent several sessions uh, recording his ideas. He gave me a shopping list of things that we should cover, you know, uh, starting from, from the very beginning. And this is, these are layouts from the interior of the book. We managed to do it. It was one of the most difficult projects I've ever had to work on. So I would, uh, I would take his recordings, I would write the text, I'd run it through my editor, and then Buzz would send it out to Buzz, and then he'd correct it, and it went back and forth for quite a while. We have uh, Dr. Robert Goddard, which is a rather interesting story. Dr. Robert Goddard was the teacher of Buzz's father, Edward Aldrin, Aldrin Sr., and uh, also was a good friend of uh, Buzz's father, and uh, Buzz actually got to meet Dr. Robert Goddard when he was younger. And we have John Glenn, uh, Friendship 7, uh, the first Mer uh, Mercury uh, mission where John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth three times. In the book, there's a whole chart uh, showing all the various uh, Apollo uh, missions and all the rocks, the, the number of rocks that they brought back, about, back from the moon, all the various stats on the uh, the uh, Atlas rocket, which is 36 stories tall, amazing. And of course, Buzz's dream, and always has been, is to get to Mars. As a matter of fact, his t-shirt, his fav favorite t-shirt he wears is, get your ass to Mars. Uh, he is, he, he said, I, I know I won't live to see it, but this, the, the estimate now is probably between 2035 and 2040 may be the first chance we may have to have a, mission, a manned mission to Mars. Um, there's a connection uh, of Amelia Earhart and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, the first uh, plane that, that uh, Buzz rode in was, was, was christened by Amelia Earhart. Buzz's father was a friend of Amelia Earhart and Wilbur Wright and a number of other famous flyers, and uh, Charles Lindbergh being one. 
Now, this is a, a, a flight, her 1932 flight, no, most people don't know about. It was her successful Atlantic crossing. Five years later, she disappeared over the Pacific. So what I had to do was I used uh, my references at Purdue University, um, where most of her papers are stored. This is a typical rough layout of the book, and I'm just getting started. Um, what I did was I tried to locate the, the Lockheed Vega. There were only 132 of these planes made from the late 20s, to early 30s. And I found one in Florida. Kermit Weeks runs the Fan Flight of Fantasy Museum. And I got permission to use his Vega with a model because I wanted that sense of proportion. When you look at a Lockheed Vega, you don't know the proportion of man to, to human. And what's interesting is the cockpit was so small that the back of the the seat in the cockpit was the cockpit door behind, right directly behind the uh, pilot. So here is my first illustration of, of Amelia before she takes off. And my friend uh, Keith Ferris, who is probably the most noted aviation artist in the world, has every schematic drawing of every plane ever made. So I called Keith right away and I said, I need all the stats on the Lockheed Vega. He says, no problem, he's emailed these to me. And so I was able to get, and there were different, each Lockheed Vega was made to order so that they, they had, each one was slightly different, a larger tail, a smaller tail. And she, she had a Lockheed Vega 5B, which I had to make sure was ab absolutely accurate. Uh, this is the beginning of the end paper. Uh, she, she flew from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, she left May 20, five years to the day of Lindbergh's flight, and flew 15 hours nonstop. And her original plan was to go to Paris, but she had so many mechanical problems, she made it as far as Northern Ireland, but she managed to land in Gallagher's field, uh, and uh, thus her successful transatlantic flight. What else did I do? I found, I located a reasonably good model of a Lockheed Vega, which helped me gather the proportions. And I also used uh, my photo shoot to see the real airplane to get a con comparison of those two. Doing a rough sketch, and this was the, the final painting, which actually became the cover. Uh, she, the, the field that she flew from, from Harbor Grace, was just a gravel field. And I had to research the time of day where the site mounted, she, she took off at 7, 12 p.m., where the sun would have been at that point in time when she takes off over the ocean. She thinks it's gonna be a, 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 a real easy flight, but it turns out she ran into a terrible storm not too far out into the ocean. These are just rough sketch ideas of what it might be for her to, for, for you to see her in the interior. And what I finally did was we photographed, I sent my sketches down, the photographer photographed, so you really get a sense of pilot to, to instrument panel. Uh, there was my angle that I used for her likeness. Um, Dorothy Cochran, who is the general aviation curator at the Air and Space Museum, sent me this photograph. This is actually the instrument panel from Amelia's real plane. So when you combine all of these elements, there she is flying into the thunderstorm. Or she lost her altimeter, she lost her speed indicator. She only had a gyro to indicate she was doing dead reckoning. She had a leak in the manifold, which was blowing blue flame in her face. And she had a fuel leak behind her dripping down the back of her neck. She had to fly all night long like that. She had no choice. So here's, she was up at around 3,000 feet and she ran into an ice storm. She began to ice up, she lost control and she went down 3,000 feet and managed with all her strength to pull up just above the water. She had no choice. All she took with her, there's no autopilot, no radio. She had to have her hand on the stick at all times. Uh, no bathroom breaks, and she had one can of tomato juice with her, which she never used for 15 hours straight. There again, getting a sense of the proportion of the aircraft. So just at daybreak, uh, after flying for the last several hours, she realizes she's got to find a, a, a safe place to land, and she has to give up on her goal of Paris. 
So here she comes in uh, the cliffs of Northern Ireland. There was fog that morning. Uh, she, she barely escaped above the cliffs to, to save herself. And eventually she was looking for you know, a road or, or somewhere that she could land. Well, she couldn't find anything, but she found an open field, which happened to be Gallagher's field. She had to fly by once to scare away the cattle and eventually wound up as the propeller comes to a stop, she realizes not only she has crossed the Atlantic, she has crossed something much bigger. She really, uh, this flight gave her the will to go on the Pacific flight, which unfortunately she never succeeded in. And when she, the farmer's hand comes out and said, uh, who are you? She says, I'm Amelia from America. Why would you do a children's book on Abraham Lincoln's funeral train? It's a rather emotional story. There were more than 30 million people who participated in Lincoln funerals across the country and went out to greet the funeral train, which uh, traveled 1,600 miles for 13 days, never traveled more than 15 miles an hour, day or night, rain or shine. People would come out to greet this. This is about young Luke and his father, who was a, a Civil War veteran, wanting to go say goodbye to his commander-in-chief where the railroad comes through his town. I got permission from the Lincoln Library to photograph the scale model of the, the Nashville, which was one of the most brightly colored engines that pulled the train uh, through Ohio. There were several engines that pulled the 11-car train simply because they're uh, their uh, limit in distance was, was uh, much limited, so they changed off engines. But I, this was my model for, uh, for doing my paintings. So Luke and his father get up before dawn to travel down to the, to the railroad to, to greet uh, the train as it comes in. Just like Norman Rockwell, I, I use a lot of models. This is a father and son, uh, one of, one of a, my carpenter friends who really became Luke and his father for the book. And there they are waiting for the train. And the train is coming down. And this was probably one of the most uh, emotional events in American history to that day. Um, there were several funerals held all along the way. And what I found interesting is that for Lincoln's body was taken out, put in a, a church, the casket was opened, and everybody got to pass by. And uh, the undertakers in every town made sure that they had to dust Lincoln's body off because of all the traveling that he was doing. It was really lots, so many things that I learned from doing this book. There was only one book on the Lincoln funeral train that I found at the Lincoln bookstore in Chicago, which gave me most of the information. Uh, but it was uh, not much researched at the time, so I was able to create all these nocturnal paintings uh, of the train through through the through using the models and s doing some other research. Edward Hopper paints his world as another com a combination with Robert Burley. We do we, we collaborate a lot, and Hopper is one of my all-time favorite painters. And what this book does is you follow Hopper uh, while he's discovering his world. We all know Nighthawks. That cafe never really existed. He made it up. I kind of imagined that he, we only lived three blocks away from each other in the village. He was at 3 Washington Square North and we were over on West 4th Street. I never, he died the year before I came to New York. But there are a number of little corner cafes and things in the village that could possibly have been the genesis of Nighthawks. So this is what I imagined what he might have seen and this is actually what he actually painted. One of my favorite paintings is Gas 1940. I think it's at the uh, Museum of Modern Art. So what I did was here are the hoppers driving by that gas station in their old, their old Buick on Highway 6 in Wellfleet. So you get the sense that it was the painting, but it's not. Early Sunday morning, another favorite painting of mine. Um, doing a lot of research, Gail Levin, who was his... Uh, who was the curator at the Whitney Museum and his biographer. I worked with her, and she was very helpful in getting everything right. She vetted the entire book. And here is Edward Hopper 
walking through his early Sunday morning. What's interesting is I got to visit his Free Washington Square North studio and also the studio at uh, Truro. Believe it or not, the top two photographs, that's Hopper's kitchen. You can see why they, eat, they ate out a lot. <laughs> Joe, Joe Hopper hated to cook, but it was such a humbling experience to see this very Shaker-esque, very stark studio. That uh, stove was what they used to heat the main part of the studio. You can see his, e on the lower left, you can see that's his easel. Uh, it is now part of NYU, and you can actually make an appointment to go visit that studio. It's well worth the trip. Here's a piece from the book where he's obviously in residence and the uh, pot belly stove is going strong. And the portrait on, on, the, on the mantle is a self-portrait he did when he was 20 years old. I also got to, to see and visit his studio in Truro, which was quite a thrill. He painted a number of his classic masterpieces there. So you can see the the, the modern studio does not have all the divisions in the windows. It was probably replaced years ago. But there's Edward and Joe Hopper looking out at Cape Cod Bay. And this is coming out October 1st. Another collaboration with my friend Robert Burley. Hi, I'm Norman. The story of American illustrator Norman Rockwell. And it's going to be for children. And as far as I know, it's the only book done so far. In that, in that genre. So I watch for it October 1st. We'll probably be doing an event here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.